Uh, okay, Jeff, the recording has started. Please uh, uh, okay. start. Awesome. Thanks very much. Uh, so, yeah, I'm going to be talking about uh, leading order corrections to the quantum extremal surface prescription, uh, which is some um, work that should be out on archive relatively soon if we can you know, finish up the draft and get the editing done. Uh, and it's with Chris Akers at MIT. Um, okay, so let's just start with a very boring slide about ADS-CFT um, that will be very, very familiar to, to almost all of you, I imagine. Um, so ADS-CFT, of course, is this duality between quantum gravity in D plus one dimensional anti sitter space, or the bulk, um, and a non-gravitational conformal field theory. Okay, so anti de Sitter space is, you know, a spatial slice of it is what's called hyperbolic space. Um, so, you know, all these fishes that seem to get very, very small out towards the boundary of the space are actually all the same size, it's infinitely big. Um, so this duality, uh, and our aim, you know, one of the main aims in, in high energy physics is to understand the dictionary that relates sort of objects on the two sides to this duality, and thereby learn more about quantum gravity. Um, so one sort of element of the dictionary that's, that's been, you know, very, very important in the last decade, decade and a half is something called the Rio Takianagi formula, um, which basically says if you take some subregion of the boundary, say this, this region B that I've drawn here, um, then you can consider the von Neumann entropy of the reduced state of the boundary theory on that subregion. Uh, and the Rio Takianagi formula says that that entropy is given approximately by the area of the surface through the bulk anchored on that boundary region that has the smallest area. Um, so this beautiful formula that's, that's led to all sorts of progress, um, but it's not quite right. Uh, in particular, for our purposes, it needs to include quantum corrections. Okay, so what are these quantum corrections? It's that you shouldn't really be just minimizing area. Um, you should really be minimizing area over 4G Newton um, plus an additional term, which is just the bulk entanglement between bulk fields on either side of this surface. So if, say, this blue fish here is in a state that's entangled with this blue fish over here, then that entanglement will contribute uh, to the boundary entropy, and in fact, it can affect um, you know, what the what the surface is that defines the entropy. Okay, so the formula I've given here is really just for static states, um, but it's all we're going to need for this talk. So, so I'll leave it at that. Um, but the surface that minimizes thing this thing is known as the the minimal quantum extremal surface. Um, okay, so. This formula can, you know, there is a derivation of this formula. There's a load of papers going back originally to, to Lukovitz and Maldacena um, in 2013 or so on. So, uh, and this derivation really just comes from the, the gravitational path integral. Um, so this is a fairly sort of well-established um, element of the, the ADS-CFT dictionary. Um, and it's also, you know, it's a, it's a result that's led to a number of sec successes. Um, in particular, so over the course of 2019, um, it led to a derivation of the page curve for the backward and blind space, which is something you need to, to have consistency with, with unitarity. Um, it's sort of a key part of showing that information escapes from the blind space. Um, but really, the point of this talk is going to be saying that actually, um, the quantum extremal surface description, or at least a naive application of it, isn't always true. If you really just try to, to take that formula and apply it left, right, and center without thinking carefully about when you're doing so, um, then you actually get paradoxical results. Uh, and these paradoxes, in fact, exist even if you're only expecting the quantum extremal surface description to give you the sort of correct answer, a leading order, in G Newton, so the order one over G Newton is part of the answer. Um, so it's not enough to say that maybe there's tiny little corrections to this prescription. You actually, even even at the yeah the leading order, it's just it's just off 
has to be off by some multiplicative factor. Um, so when do these paradoxes show up? Well, they show up in all sorts of cases. Um, they can be seen, for example, in, in calculations involving evaporating black holes and, and things very closely related to the page curve calculations. Um, they are not going to be have time to, to talk about those particular cases. But they also show up for states that don't actually involve any black holes at all. Um, so they're, they're a pretty general phenomenon. Um, all you need is that you need to have some source of bulk entropy that can really compete with this A over 4G Newton term. Uh, so what we'll see, however, is that if we're a bit more careful about sort of calculating the entropy and, and going back to the original derivations of the entropy formula from the, the gravitational part integral, then what we see is that actually the, uh, that calculation in these circumstances doesn't give you the, the quantum extreme surface prescription and the, the, the calculations to get the entropy, in fact, see that these, these sort of leading order corrections should exist. The assumptions that were needed to conclude you got the, the quantum extreme surface prescription um, actually fail, and you just get a different answer. So instead, what you find is that the, the naive quantum extremal surface prescription needs to be replaced by a more refined version of it um, that involves these things called smooth min and max entropies. Um, so these are, these are concepts from quantum information. Specifically, they show up a lot in something called one-shot quantum Shannon theory. Um, and yeah, they're really going to play an important role in this talk. Um, and yeah, they're, they're, they're entropies, like the von Neumann entropy, uh, but they're not necessarily equal to the von Neumann entropy. And they aren't equal, find that, that you know, the, their values matter in addition to the values of Um, so as I say, there's sort of some, some reasonably close connections between the ideas I'm going to be talking about in this talk and um, sort of ideas in one-shot quantum match Shannon theory. And particularly, uh, the, the results for the quantum extremal surface prescription, and even more specifically, the, the consequences of those results for what's called entangled wedge reconstruction are going to be very closely related to something in one-shot quantum Shannon theory called one-shot quantum state merger. Um, so that's just a particular task that people care about in information theory, and it's basically going to be equivalent to the task in time. Okay, so that is a sort of preview. Uh, let's start diving right into the main part of the talk. Um, and the first thing I want to talk about is I want to show why the, the very naive application of the, the QES prescription gives paradox. Okay, so the setup I'm going to be considering is a setup where we, we actually don't have a black hole, just because it's in some sense simplest to not have to worry about that. And that's what's called a dust ball. So this, this particular setup really goes back to a paper by Akers, Leichenauer, and Levine um, from last summer, I believe. Um, so, okay, so what's, what are we going to do? We're going to consider a boundary region, and we call Big B. Uh, that's going to consist of two intervals in ADS3 CFU2. Uh, so this top interval and this bottom interval. This boundary region is going to have two extremal surfaces. Uh, the topologies are sort of one homotopic to Big B, consists of this surface and this surface, call it gamma 2, and one homotopic to the complement, consists of these two surfaces here. Okay. And in principle, either of these can be the, the minimal quantum extreme surface. It just depends which of them has the smaller generalized entropy. So, you know, you, you have these two surfaces in the vacuum state, but we can also consider them in, in a situation where you also have matter. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to add a load of matter sitting in the middle of this anti sitter space. And the energy of this matter is going to be order epsilon over g meter, okay, where epsilon is some small but order one number. This matter is going to back react on the geometry. We're no longer, it's no longer going to look like back, vacuum ADS. Einstein's equation is going to change because the matter is there. Um, but because epsilon is small and because there's a g Newton 
Newton's constant, and Einstein's equation, then the back reaction is small. So it's, it's a small perturbative correction in the vacuum agent. In particular, you don't have anything crazy like a black hole horizon, at least unless you evolve forward in Lorentzian time for, for quite a while. Uh, okay. Uh, so if this matter was in a thermal state, uh, which is a perfectly reasonable state to consider, then its entropy would be the same order of magnitude as its energy. Um, and it will therefore have an entropy that is order epsilon over g newton. Okay, this entropy will contribute to the generalized entropy of this surface gamma one, because it is between the surface gamma one and the boundary region B, but it won't contribute to the generalized entropy of the surface gamma two, okay? Because it's not between gamma two and the boundary region B. I'm gonna call this region between gamma two and the boundary region, and we call little b, and this sort of central region in the middle that is between the two extremal surfaces, I'm gonna call little b prime, okay? Just for good greatness. So we have this entropy S for the thermal state that is, you know, some small number times one over G Newton. And if we tune the size of the boundary region B very nicely to make it very, very close to being half the boundary, then we can set things up. So this entropy S is enough to change uh, which of the two extremal surfaces has smaller generalized entropy. So A1 over four G Newton plus S is bigger than A2 over four G Newton but A2 over 4G Newton is bigger than A1 over 4G Newton. Okay. So now we're ready to, to set up a paradox um, just by doing a few calculations. Okay, so let's first consider the case where all this matter sitting in the middle is just in some typical pure state, some typical energy eigenstate, say, so that the back reaction is still there. We still have a single, the same geometry we had before. Uh, but if it's in a pure state, then the von Neumann entropy is zero. So the generalized entropy of this surface, gamma one, is just A1 over 4G Newton. So that's smaller than A2, so that's the smallest extremal surface. Um, so the entropy of the boundary region B is just A1 over 4G Newton. We can also consider the matter, a state where the matter is in a thermal state. Okay, in that case, A1 over 4G Newton plus S is bigger than A2 over 4G Newton. And so the extremal surface is gamma two, and the entropy is A2 over 4G. So these are both completely fine, and the quantum extremal surface description gives sensible answers for them. But we can also consider just taking an incoherent mixture of the two. Okay, so sort of P times the pure state plus one minus P times the thermal state. Now, what does the quantum extremal surface description say? Well, the generalized entropy of this surface gamma one is A1 over 4G Newton plus the entropy of this sort of bulk mixture, which is one minus P times the thermal entropy. And the entropy of gamma two is still A2 over 4G Newton. So the QES prescription says that the entropy is just the smaller of these two quantities. However, um, the boundary state, you know, the, the bulk to boundary map in ADS CFT is linear. So that means the boundary state will also be a mixture of the two boundary states, the pure and the thermal boundary state. Partial trace is linear, so the reduced state on B will also be a mixture of those two states. It's a well-known fact that the entropy of the mixture of two states is just given by you know, the expectation value of the entropies of the two individual states, um, plus at most some sort of order one entropy of mixing. So that means up to this order one thing that will depend on whether the states are orthogonal or have some overlap. Then we have a formula for, for the entropy of big B that must be true, but it's just a, it's linearly interpreting between the, the two. We vary the, the probability of each in the mixture. But these two formulas just disagree. They disagree at leading order in one over G Newton. Um, you know, one, yeah, one, if, if, if I plug in you know, the value of, of P that makes these two things be equal, um, then this one will be equal to A2 over 4G Newton, and this one will be equal to P A1 over 4G Newton plus one minus P A2 over 4G Newton. 
It's different at leading order. Okay, so there's our paradox. Great. Um, so before I go on to trying to understand how to sort of resolve this paradox a bit more, I want to make some some sort of heuristic comments about why we might expect, you know, at this point, all we know is that the quantum extreme surface description can't be right for all three of those states, pure state, thermal state, and the mixture. Um, but I, I sort of claimed that the mixture was the one where it's wrong. So why, why might we think it's more likely to be wrong for the mixture than for the pure state? Well, the thermal state, uh, of some sort of large, quantum mechanical mixture uh, can be very well approximated um, by a state whose rank is just e to the s, where s here is the, the entropy of that thermal state, plus something subleading in s. So up to some subleading correction, we can approximate that thermal state by a, a state that only has e to the s non-zero eigen. A more technical way of saying this is that the smooth max entropy of the thermal state is approximately equal to the von Neumann entropy of the thermal state. Smooth max entropy, at least to, you know, for the moment, is, it can just define to be the sort of log of the state of smallest rank that is a good approximation of the, the state you want to get. Okay, so the, this second line is really just a restatement of the first line. In terms of this, this quantity smooth max. The same thing is true, of course, for a pure state, a zero von Neumann entropy. And similarly, we can approximate it by a state of rank one because it is a state of rank one. Uh, and so it's smooth max entropy. The log of that is also equal to zero. However, if we take a mixture of the two, not the mixture of the true, I don't know where that typo came from. Um, then trying to approximate that mixture with a sort of high accuracy is basically as hard as just approximating the thermal state itself, right? If, if you have something very close to a mixture of pure and thermal state, then it can be necessarily written as a sum of something very close to a pure state and something very close to the thermal state, both of which can't have larger rank. And hence, yeah, um, we can't approximate this mixture with state of much smaller rank than the, the, the approximation. So another way of saying this is that the smooth max entropy of this mixture is given by the thermal entropy, is given by equal to the von Neumann entropy of the mixture divided by one minus. They differ at sort of leading order in the, the thermal entropy. And a general rule is going to be that you know, whenever we have these sort of incompressible states uh, where sort of the number of degrees of freedom you need to encode them is always much bigger than, than you, the entropy might suggest, then you can have these sort of large corrections showing up. Okay. Um, so let's move on to, to part two, which is going to be showing how you know, this thing I call the paradox isn't actually a paradox at all uh, because when you actually calculate what the entropy should be, then you, you get the, the non-paradoxical right answer and not the quantum extreme description answer. Okay, so how do you actually calculate the entropy of boundary regions in quantum physics? How do you calculate the the you know, I said you do it using the gravitational path integral, but how do you ever calculate an entropy using a path integral? It's slightly non-trivial, okay? It's not something you can sort of do directly, um, but what you can do is calculate something called an integer n rainy entropy. It's given by this formula. In particular, this is determined by the trace of the reduced state to the power n, okay? And the trace of, of reduced state to the power n, just sort of an observable, can be computed on, on n copies of the system. It can be computed using a path integral. Once you've done that for all values of n, then you can, sometimes in practice, sometimes only in principle, 
take the answer and analytically continue it as a function of n. This formula is analytic. Uh, and when you take the limit where n goes to 1, then by L'Hopital's rule, uh, you find that you exactly get the von Neumann. Okay, so that's sort of a general statement of what the idea of the replica trick is. How about what you actually do in practice in ADS CFT? So, states in ADS CFT can be prepared using Euclidean path integrals. Okay, so in particular, you can prepare uh, sort of bras and you can prepare kets using Euclidean path integrals. And then you can prepare mixed states by sort of summing over the boundary. Um, okay, I've got my thing slightly out of sync. Uh, so if we're computing tracer row to the n, then we have n bras and n kets. So that gives us sort of two n total Euclidean path integrals, just to, to make the copies of row. And then you need to, uh, you know, we, we want to turn that into something that actually evaluates tracer row to the n. So the first thing you need to do is you need to do a partial trace, right? So that we get our reduced state. Um, how do you do that? Well, partial trace just means you take all the boundaries uh, that you, of the regions you don't want and you glue them together. Uh, so in our case, we want to take a partial trace of a B bar with this boundary region and this boundary region. So we glue this stuff here to the corresponding stuff in the bra up here. The same over this side and the same in all the other copies. Now we want to, so that, that gives us the reduced states. Now we want to take trace of row to the end of those reduced states. And again, that means we glue the bras to the kets and so on. But now rather than gluing the bra to its partner ket, which would just be trace of row, then we glue them around in a sort of cyclic permutation. So this region B here gets glued to the bra on the next one over. And then the ket here gets glued to the bra one over. And then eventually the ket here gets glued back to the original bra and that's taking the trace into the cyclic thing. Okay, so that big gives us some, some boundary conditions, which in this case will just be some you know, genus, whatever it is, Riemann, sur Riemann surface has some non-trivial topology, but it, it's just the boundary conditions it is. And then we want to do this using gravitation, evaluate this using gravitational path integral. So what does that mean? It just means you integrate over all the bulk geometries that have these boundaries. In particular, when you take the limit where G Newton goes to zero, semi, everything is semi-classical, you can approximate those bulk geometry, that bulk path integral by a sum over bulk saddle points, solutions to the classical bulk equation. Okay. So I've now explained how the, the replica trick is done as a sort of you know, path integral over geometries with certain boundary conditions, um, but that doesn't mean we know how to actually do said bulk path integral, so even said bulk sum over saddles. Um, and in fact, in general, finding bulk geometries that have the, the correct boundary conditions is very hard, even in sort of vacuum ADS3. It can really get quite hard um, when you get beyond the sort of very simplest cases. Uh, but there's a particular class of states that are called fixed area states, um, where it's actually quite simple. Uh, so these are states where you sort of prepare a state you know, whatever it might be, like the vacuum state or the state with a load of matter sitting in the middle or something like that. And then what you do is you measure the areas of all the extremal surfaces in that state. And you get some outcome of that measurement is what it is. So you're now in a state where the, the areas of these surfaces are fixed. Okay. How does this help you? Well, that means that, you know, if you want to find um, greater way to the end, for one of these fixed area states, then you don't need to do a path integral over the area of the area of any of the extremal surfaces, right? Because you've already measured that, so it's fixed at some particular measurement outcome. You don't have to integrate over it. So this means, in turn, that when you look for saddle points, the equation solutions of the equations of motion, then those equations of motion are allowed to have a conical singularity that sits at the extremal surface. Conical singularity, is sort of the the canonically quant conjugate quantity to the area of that surface. It's like if you, if you fixed x 
measured x in a path integral um, at some intermediate time, then you can have saddle points where the momentum change discontinuously at that time, right? Because fixing x, by measuring x, you're, you're uh, no longer integrating over x, and that means that you, you no longer have to have p the Bayes equation. Okay, so this, this might seem a technical point, but the beautiful thing about it is that it ends up meaning that all the bulk geometries with these boundary conditions just look like copies of the sort of original bulk geometry we had for, for evaluating the, the density matrix itself without having multiple copies glued together. And there's just one thing that needs to change, which is now um, the different parts of the different the bulk geometries get glued together. Uh, just like the boundaries did, they're glued together in a way so that you have branch cuts sitting at these extremal surfaces. Okay, these branch cuts mean when you go in a loop around these extremal surface, then you sort of change sheet. Uh, and so you have to go around multiple times maybe to get back to where you started. And that creates conical singularities. But we've already established that, that conical sing there can be conical singularities and you'll still obey the equation. Jeff, can I interrupt? Uh, so these fixed area states, are, do they form some basis of states or is just some class of states? Uh, yeah, they, they yeah, non-perturbatively it's questionable how, how well these things are, are defined, but at least semi-classically then they form a basis of states, yeah. So, so sort of generic state will be a superposition over, over states of different areas. Um, yeah, that's ah, okay, thanks. Okay, so how are these different sheets glued together in the bulk? Well, we know that sort of this boundary here, it's just glued to the same boundary up here. Okay, and so for the bulk to match those boundary conditions, this sort of region next to it also has to be glued to the corresponding region on the same sheet up here. Okay, uh, similarly, this region here, this big B, has to be glued to the sort of cyclically permuted sheet. Um, so that means when we pass up through, through sort of this bulk region close to big B, then we also have to get cyclically permuted through the bulk sheet. Okay, use the letter tau to, to denote this particular permutation that permutes like one, two, two, three, and so on. Um, but we also have this region in the middle. And this region in the middle doesn't, doesn't go out to any boundary. Uh, so it can sort of have any permutation pi that we want when we pass through it. Okay, that will, you know, we, we can have branch cuts sitting at these extreme surfaces without problem, so we can have that, that permutation do anything we want. So that means that, you know, any permutation pi corresponds to uh, a saddle with the right boundary condition. So we just have to sum all of, over all of them when we do the, the path integral. When you do the sum, over all of them, uh, it turns out that the sort of most of the gravitational action, because it's just the original bulk geometry, actually cancels uh, when you do the normalization of the boundary state. When you divide through by trace of rho, then you divide through by the sort of original gravitational action, so that just disappears. Um, the only sort of part of the gravitational action that doesn't disappear is the fact that in this sort of bulk geometry and trace row to the end geometry, then you have these conical singularities. You don't in the, the normalization, right? That's, that's trace of row to the power n rather than trace of row to the n. Um, so these conical singularities give an action, uh, it's just proportional to the area. Um, uh, so that gives the term here. And then you also get a term from, from the bulk fields. And the, the thing you get from the bulk fields is, well, this, this thing is just computing an inner product of bulk states, um, except uh, it's bulk states where you have these permutation operators applied to certain bulk regions. So it's just a trace of n copies of the bulk state with a permutation operator applied to this region little b, and a permutation operator tau applied to the region little b, and permutation operator pi applied to the So I'll just make a few comments on this formula. Um, so 
the C of pi and C of tau inverse pi. Okay, that's the, the action that you get from these conical singularities at each of the two surfaces. Uh, but C of pi here is the number of cycles in the permutation pi. Similarly for C of tau inverse composed with pi. Okay, because basically that's, that tells you, um, yeah, it tells you the, the, the number of conical singularities that you get around the thing, and so it controls the action. Um, so the first thing you can note about this formula is that A1 and A2 are actually really infinite quantities, right? This, this anti dissidus space is, is infinitely big. Uh, they're divergent. And so what that means is that any saddle that doesn't maximize the sum of these two numbers uh, is going to be infinitely suppressed compared to the leading saddle. Okay, so those permutations pi just don't count. They can be forgotten about completely. Um, we only have to care about the ones that maximize that sum. And the permutations that do so, it turns out, are in one-to-one -one correspondence with something called uh, non-crossing partitions. Um, don't worry about the details of what that is. Suffice it to say that there is a large mathematical literature on these things. Um, you know, they're associated with the theory of free probability, random matrices, and so on. Um, but yeah, so, so we're left with just a sum over these, these non-crossing permutations. Um, and now we have this, this reasonably nice formula as a function of n. And to get the von Neumann entropy, what we need to do is we need to analytically continue it to the limit where n goes to 1. Okay? But here is where we run into a very big problem, which is the number of terms in this sum, the number of sort of non-crossing permutations that contribute to it, uh, actually depends on n. The number of permutations obviously grows with n. Uh, the number of non-crossing permutations grows less quickly. It grows with something called the Catalan numbers, but it still grows. Okay, and so what you certainly can't do is just analytically continue sort of the formula for each term in the sum separately. Um, yeah. Uh, so one thing you might do is you might say let's just take the permutation that that contributes the largest amount. Uh, and in many cases, that will be either sort of the identity permutation or the, the permutation tau itself. Okay? And you could just say, let's only think about that permutation, then we just have one term in the sum, and now we can analytically continue. That is, in fact, the assumption that was made by Lukovic Maricina, and it's the assumption that you need to do to get the quantum extreme surface. Okay? But really, we have all these other terms in the sum, and we have to be very careful if we're going to drop. Fortunately, there exists technology from this theory of free probability that lets us just sort of not directly analytically continue this whole sum, but work out what the analytic continuation of the sum is. So how do you do that? You take advantage of something called the resolvent, which is just given by this formula. It's just the trace of the inverse of lambda minus rho. And it can be see, easily seen by just doing a Taylor series expansion. So this is just given by sort of the rank of rho, trace of rho to the zero over lambda, plus sort of a sum over powers of trace of rho to the n. Okay, so this, this resolvent is fundamentally determined by the formula for trace of rho to the n that I had back here. Um, and the amazing thing about the, the resolvent is you can see just by using the cauchy riemann formula uh, that when we sort of take the imaginary part of this resolvent in the limit where we approach the real axis, then it ends up just giving us the, the eigenvalue density of states of rho, right? The sort of, um, yeah, it, it, the Cauchy principal value of the, the one over lambda minus x, if you look at, gives you an imaginary part that gives you a delta function at uh, x. Okay, so in principle, if we can compute this resolvent, then we have everything, right? The density of states tells us not just the von Neumann entropy, it tells us the location of every single eigenvalue of rho. And then it's a trivial matter to just integrate it against lambda to get the von Neumann. 
So for the particular case of uh, the mixture of the pure state and the thermal state that I discussed before, um, then the technology I talked about for, for, for free probability actually just gives you an equation for this resolver using the formulas of trace to AVN. And I'm not gonna have time to talk about how, how this technology works, um, but you can look at my paper with Steve Schenker, Douglas Stanford, and Jenbin Yang from last November uh, to see how it works applied to a very similar situation. Um, but for our particular case, when you get an equation for R that just looks like this, okay? Um, and it's pretty easy to see that if you just multiply out the denominators here, then this is just a cubic equation for R as a function of lambda. Cubic equations have a general formula, you can just solve them, um, but nobody ever got any insight of, from writing down the general formula for solving a cubic equation. Um, so we're not going to do that. Uh, instead, we're going to use the fact that for various values of R, then we can can simplify this one. In particular, this sort of one minus p over a, e to the a one over four g plus plus s. That's a really big number. Uh, so unless r is really 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 big, then this number is tiny compared to this number, um, and we can just completely ignore uh, this correction. Similarly. If R is really, 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 really big, then this term gets absolutely huge because it has a factor of R, becomes much bigger than this term, and so we can ignore this term at sufficiently large R. And because this denominator doesn't have an extra factor of E to the S, then there's actually a sort of overlapping region where we can do either of those things or both of those things and still, still be valid. Okay? Either of these approximations are enough to turn this cubic equation into something that's just a quadratic equation. The formula for a quadratic equation is a hell of a lot nicer than the formula for the cubic equation. It's you know, something we all learned in high school. Um, so that's something that you, you can actually solve and get some insights out of. Uh, in particular, it's a formula that gives you a non-zero imaginary part uh, and hence non-zero density of states, even only if the discriminant is negative. Right, even only if b squared minus 4ac is, is strictly less than 0. Um, so I'm not going to go through the details, but you can, you can just take those quadratics, work out where they have negative discriminants, and they, they sort of each have one small region where they do uh, within their regime of validity. And so you get a, a complete density of states that has these, these two regions with non-zero support, okay? The first is that it has sort of e to the a1 eigenvalues with eigenvalue p over e to the a1, okay? So this is exactly the set of eigenvalues multiplied by p uh, that you would get for the pure state, okay? Then it also has a peak in the other regime of validity, and uh, that consists of sort of e to the a2 over 4g g newton minus e to the a1 over 4g newton eigenvalues, i.e. if the, the, the whole state, the sum of all the eigenvalues is e to the a2, and these remaining eigenvalues are basically e to the minus a2 over 4g. So that's where you would find all the eigenvalues in the thermal state. Okay, so we've managed to get a formula for the density of states, so it really is just a mixture of the density of densities of states that you would get for the pure and the thermal state separately. At that point, it's just a simple matter of integrating d lambda times sort of minus lambda log lambda to get the von Neumann entry. And we do indeed find that it's the sort of right formula, which is just a linear, linear mixture of the two. This has to be the case because our density of states with, with the mixture. Um, so that's great. Uh, the, the replica trick, you know, isn't, isn't lying, it isn't telling us nonsense answers, all is well. Um, but this is just sort of one particular random example where the, the sort of, you know, replica trick happens to be particularly easy to do, so we can do it all very explicitly and solve it all exactly. Uh, what we really want to know is like a, a general rule for when you should care about 
when the quantum extreme surface description is right, when it needs a sort of more refined version that includes larger directions. Uh, and so that's what I'm going to talk about now. Um, I'm just going to sort of make brief comments of all the various ways that, that you know, these results generalize. Um, the first is that maybe rather than having a mixture of sort of pure state and a, a thermal state, you have some kind of like, you know, some just arbitrary bulk state in region in this sort of central region that'll be prime. Okay. Sorry, Jeff, Jeff, could I interrupt uh, before you yep. go on to this part of your talk? Uh, you know, somehow the fundamental uh, point initially was that you have to, you, you consider a, a boundary region that's disconnected and so there are two, uh, I think you call them B and B prime and you inserted right. and you inserted a state in the middle and the key point seems to be that it contributed to one of the, uh, uh, um, it contributed uh, when, I mean, so we were supposed to come uh, include its contribution if the surface was one yep. way and not yep. the other way. Yep. And I was just uh, sorry, uh, it's just probably my confusion. Uh, the reason for this, uh, so the contribution of this new state you inserted, I thought was supposed to be its entanglement with whatever was inside the, um, uh, was on the other side of some surface. And I, I didn't see where that, that entanglement came into your calculation. Yeah. I. I... The, the real answer is it's just the von Neumann entropy of everything between the surface you're considering and the boundary region. Mm -hmm. Okay, if, if it's a pure state, then that von Neumann entropy will all be entanglement entropy. Mm -hmm. But in this case, it's just a mixed state. One, one you, know, you could imagine like purifying it with like some other holographic system and then it's entanglement ah. between the, but yeah, in, in general, it's really just the von Neumann entropy. So this is actually what Lukovitz and Maldesena were claiming. That's sort of the original proposal. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. The, 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 that it's the von Neumann entropy. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. It's, it's actually not the original Lukovitz and Maldesena paper. It's um, a paper with Tom Faulkner a few months later called mm -hmm. uh, yeah. The, okay. It's sometimes known as the FLM correction. This this von Neumann entropy. Um, but okay. yeah, that is the original claim. Okay. Thanks a lot. Okay. Um, yeah, so it turns out happily enough that that sort of you can you can't do it quite as precisely, but you can basically do the same replica trick calculation, even if this sort of entropy in the middle just has some arbitrary entanglement spectrum. Uh, and what you find is that the boundary entanglement spectrum sort of looks like the bulk entanglement spectrum, sort of all multiplied by a factor of e to the minus a one. And it looks like that as you get smaller and smaller. And then when you reach e to the minus a2, then the entanglement spectrum just gets cut off. And sort of instead of having all these like smaller bulk eigenvalues, you just get a load of eigenvalues just sitting at e to the minus a2. Uh, so it's, it's, it's roughly speaking, what happens is there's just no room left to sort of fit the remaining degrees of freedom to sort of encode those smaller eigenvalues. They just sort of end up sitting on top of each other and just forming a load of, they, they stop being orthogonal and they just end up being a, a load of eigenvalues that sit at e to the minus a2. Um, so what does that mean? Well, it means that you get large corrections for the quantum extremal surface prescription when you sort of have some eigenvalues that are bigger than, that would be bigger than e to the a2 and some that get replaced by ones that at e to the minus a2, right? So some of them, some of them get cut off, but not all of them get cut off. Uh, in other words, when uh, for any, any state close to the bulk state you're interested in, then the, the min entropy, just log of the sort of largest eigenvalue, is smaller than the difference between the two areas, but the max entropy, log of the rank, is bigger than the difference. Okay, so that's true for any state close to the bulk state, what the, the smooth part means in, in smooth min and max entropy. Um, then sort of the, the, the parts of the entanglement spectrum at e to the minus a2 and the parts at larger eigenvalues are both important. Uh, and so you, know, you get some contribution from the bulk entropy, but not all the contribution to the bulk entropy. And you end up getting large corrections to the quantum. Okay, so that's, that's one way you could generalize it and that, that can really be done just using the replica trick. 
another thing you very recently might want to do is you might want to say, okay, these fixed error states are fine, but you know, the vacuum's not a fixed error state in practice. Like these, these fixed error states have very nasty Lorentzian evolutions. Like, you know, the states we're really interested in have, have some area fluctuations. Uh, so what about them? Um, and the answer is that for the non-fixed error states that actually finding the replica geometries even is too hard, yet alone trying to like analytically continue the, the, the sum over settles that you get. Um, but the good thing is that, you know, a, a general state as I said earlier, can just be written as a superposition of different fixed area states. Um, and with a bit of care, you can basically show using sort of similar arguments to the, the, the ones we had for showing that the, the mixture of the pure and the thermal state uh, had to have an entropy that's like the expectation of the two. Um, you can show that up to sort of subleading corrections, the entropy of the, the superposition of fixed area states is just given by the expectation of the entropies for the fixed area states in the superposition. Um, so what does that mean? It means that at leading order, the, the fluctuations in the area are small, which they, they generally are semi-classically, um, then we get exactly the same results. Uh, we get this exact same condition that you get large corrections whenever the, the smooth min and the smooth max entropies of sandwich the difference in area. Um, so the final, the real complete generalization is that until now I've sort of assumed, ignored the bulk degrees of freedom that are not in this central region between the two surfaces. Um, so in particular, I've ignored the fact that there could be sort of a large amount of entropy in the region little b that's sort of nearer to the boundary than both of the surfaces. Uh, and the sort of state in, in little b can be entangled with the state in little b prime. And then it turns out, you know, that the, these tools from free probability are just not powerful enough to, to tell you how the answer works. Um, so that, that we don't have a way to explicitly do the analytic continuation. Uh, but this is where quantum information comes to the rescue. It turns out that the formula we found for fixed area states is exactly the same as the formula you get for a very simple, what's called a random tensor network, uh, which just you know, is shown here. So we have a tensor network. This, this thing labeled T, you can think of as just a hard random tripartite quantum state, where we treat one of the legs as like an input from uh, the state in little b prime, and then the output states, have a certain dimension, which is just going to be e to the, this is going to be e to the a2, and this is going to be e to the a1. And then we take those outputs, we add the bulk state in little b and little b bar, apply some unitary, and that gives us a boundary state. Okay, so just plugging in this prescription for the state uh, will give you exactly the same formula that we found in the figure. Uh, really, it, it comes to quantum information people. This comes from basically using something called Cheval duality to, to evaluate these sort of integrals over copies of our random states uh, and get sort of a sum over permutation. And then from there, it really just goes to exactly the same way. Um, so, what does this mean? It means we can indirectly work out the analytic continuation by just working out what the von Neumann entropies of, of big B and big B bar are. Uh, for this tensor network, right? Because the analytic continuation has to work for the tensor network and it has to give the same thing in both cases. It's unique if you put sufficiently nice properties on it. Um, so we can just calculate this entropy using any technique we like. And then just by doing a tensor network calculation, we've learned something about gravity. Turns out one shot quantum information, quantum Shannon theory people, you know, they could, they got this stuff down. And the answer is sort of the thing you might expect. It's exactly what we had before, except now, rather than being about whether the smooth min and max entropy is just a B, little b prime, sandwich the difference in areas. It's about whether the conditional smooth min and max entropies of little b prime conditioned on this stuff in little b. 
okay? Um, and this is very similar to the quantum extremal surface prescription, where for, for the surface gamma two, the von Neumann entropy is the von Neumann entropy of all this stuff, whereas for the surface gamma, sorry, that's for surface gamma one. For the surface gamma two, it's just the von Neumann entropy of little b. So the difference between those two is the, the conditional entropy of this thing relative to this. So we've just replaced the conditional von Neumann entropy by conditional smooth min and max entropies. And if they sandwich the difference in areas, then we'll get big growth. Okay, um, so I'm really almost done, which is good because I've been talking almost an hour. But the last thing I want to do is I want to talk about how this connects to the, the ideas of entanglement which reconstruction, and also to some ideas from quantum information uh, called one-shot quantum state. Um, so what is entanglement wedge reconstruction? Basically, it's the idea that everything between your minimal quantum extremal surface and your boundary region is secretly, yeah, that everything that is in the bulk in between those two things, from a boundary point of view, is encoded in the boundary. Um, so what's a more precise version of this? that given any bulk operator that sort of acts in this region, then there's a dual boundary operator by the ADS-CFT dictionary that acts just on this boundary region. Uh, so, yeah. In particular, um, yeah, the, the, what matters is the entangled wedge for a particular bulk state, rho, that may be mixed. Uh, the sort of right condition is that this boundary operator is meant to do the same thing as that bulk operator when acting on a purification of the bulk state row. Okay, hopefully that's clear. So, so um, if we just had some arbitrary bulk state, then maybe the geometry is like totally different. Maybe, yeah, it just doesn't work at all. Uh, you know, it wouldn't even make sense to talk about the boundary operator doing the same thing as the bulk operator because the, the part of the bulk where the bulk operator is meant to act doesn't exist anymore. Maybe it's in a giant black hole or something like that. Um, or it could be the case that the bulk is in some super, super highly thermal state where the entanglement wedge no longer even contains that region, right? So it's obvious at that point that our, our boundary operator can't reconstruct the bulk operator because the bulk operator is in, in the entanglement wedge. Uh, so all we require is that the boundary operator do the right thing uh, for a purification of the, the state of interest. Uh, um, yes, uh, can I ask something? Uh, yep. So this correspondence between uh, the bulk and boundary will depend on the state row, or uh, is there some Yeah, so, so we're, we're allowing this boundary operator to be state dependent in this case, yeah. Um, so yeah, it, one thing that should be said is, yeah, uh, this, this state dependence has sort of played various roles in quantum gravity, in right? particular with sort of uh, um, Papadotamus and Raju's sort of state dependence for the interiors of black holes. Um, this is not state dependence at the level of that, uh, because you know, even if we need different boundary operators on B for different states, then we don't need different operators if they're allowed to act on the whole thing. This is really just uh, this is just ordinary quantum error correction. We're trying to find an operator, trying to reconstruct stuff only on this reduced state, and yeah, that means that there'll there'll be a limit on how large the code spaces are that we can that that will be error corrected, right? So where, where we can lose access to this stuff and still remember the information sitting in the middle. Uh, if the code space is too big, then it, it may well just not be error corrected. Right? The, the entanglement. Is that clear? But to what extent uh, it will depend on this uh, state row? I mean, if I if I make some change very far away, like in some in this region B bar, in the, the region that is in the other entanglement wedge, yeah, is yeah, it yeah. so is this going to change so, this correspondence? Uh, I mean, it, so far I've just made a statement about whether an operator can exist. I haven't given you a, a, a construction that will either work or not work. Um, so one thing is true that, you know, say, say I took a mixture 
of the state without something sitting out over here and the state with something out over here, right? Then the entangled wedge of B will still be the same. And that means I can find an operator that, that works for purification of that mixture. And that means I can find an operator that, that will work regardless of whether that excitation exists. Or not. Um, so the answer is it can be, you, know, you can make something as non-state dependent as you like, as long as it's still in the entanglement wedge for, for that density metric, right? If you, you want it to work for a larger class of states, then you need to ask the question, can I sort of make my density matrix more mixed and still have it work, still have it be in the entanglement wedge? And if you can, then, then you can make it less state dependent. Is that clear? Thanks, thanks, yeah. Cool. Um, okay, so I, I'm not really going to, yeah, it, it, it turns out that um, entanglement wedge reconstruction being true is pretty much equivalent to the, the quantum extremal surface description being true. Uh, and in particular, you, you end up with exactly the same condition that you can, you can find this boundary operator that, that does the thing you want it to do, even only if the, the conditional max entropy of this little b prime conditioned on little b is less than the, the difference between the two areas. Um, so the final thing I want to say, which is going to be one of the few really quantum information comments I'm making, I'm afraid this talk ended up less quantum information heavy than I sort of thought it would, um, is that this is really essentially the same thing as, as something from quantum information called one shot debate. So what is that? Uh, so the starting point is that you have some noisy state row a b uh, that's shared between two people alice and Bob. and the task is to send alice's part of the state over to bob by sending as few qubits as possible from alice to bob and what i mean by sending alice's part of the state over to bob is we imagine that this state row is purified by something and you want to end up with bob having you know the the full purification of that you know, it's purified by a reference system, and you want to end up with Bob having the full, a perfect, or at least very, very good purification of the, the reference system. So Bob has got all the degrees of freedom that were entangled with that reference system. It takes a few seconds, maybe, to, to be clear of the fact this is true, but this is really just the Schrodinger picture version of entanglement wedge reconstruction. If you take this, this task, this you know, condition of being able to transferring Alice part of the state to Bob, and you turn it into the Heisenberg picture, then it just becomes entanglement wedge reconstruction, where sort of Bob's, Bob's part of the state is the, the sort of bulk state in region little b, right, which is always in the entanglement wedge, not behind any, any extremal surface, so he already has access to, uh, or somebody trying to reconstruct on the boundary region b already has access to. And Alice is part of the state, is the, the bulk state in, in sort of region little b prime that he maybe gets some information about, but it's not perfect because you know it's not always in the entanglement. He wants to, to get all the information so that he can sort of apply operators. So the minimum number of qubits that you need to do to, to achieve one shot quantum state merging turns out is given it's exactly given by the conditional smooth max entropy of A. Alice is part of the state conditioned on B, Bob's part of the state. So in, in entangled wedge reconstruction, this would be sort of little b prime conditioned on little b. This is exactly the quantity that ended up being relevant in, in entangled wedge reconstruction. Uh, and in particular, it had to be less than the difference between the two areas. And in fact, as a general statement that the sort of maximum number of qubits from region little b prime that can be accessed uh, in region big B, in the boundary region big B, is indeed given by the difference between areas. So in fact, gravity is saturating this, this bound on the, the, the most efficient way to do one shot quantum state merging. Um, so that's quite cool. Nice connection. Uh, there's one thing I sort of glossed over, which is for quantum state merging, uh, you're in general, allowed to have what's called a classical side channel from Alice to Bob. 
So Alice is allowed to send as many classical messages as she likes to Bob. Uh, the only thing that's limited is the, the number of qubits that she sends. It's actually, for, for quantum information theory, it's one of the more it's the, one of the more sort of reasonable and practical uh, constraints to consider, right? Classical communication is a lot easier than quantum communication. In gravity, you don't have this. The, the, in fact, the, the total number of classical bits that can be sent from little b prime or can be, be decoded from little b prime in region big B is just, it's the same thing. It's the difference between areas again. Uh, and uh, you know, there's no side channel classical information in diff addition to the, the qubits that can communicate. Uh, but there is something else, uh, which I'm not really going to define, but it's something called a zero bit side channel that goes back to work by me with my advisor, Patrick Hayden. Um, so this is something that's sort of weaker than being able to send classical messages from Alice to Bob. Alice to Bob. Uh, but it turns out it's, it's still sufficient to do quantum state matching. In fact, it's the, the minimal thing you need to be able to do quantum state matching. Um, and so in gravity, that's the thing that, that you know, plays the role of the, the, replaces the classical side channel and lets the, the, this integral wedge reconstruction task be possible with the, the minimum number of qubits being communicated. Um, okay. So that is basically the end of my talk. I'm just going to make a few brief final comments. Uh, first thing is that, as I said, the replica trick knows about more than the quantum exchange description. It's really like the, the, the summing over all the replicas is often impractical in, in practice, but it really seems to, to know deep stuff about like, the consistency of the boundary theory. Um, Another comment, which I think is an important one, is that from a quantum information point of view, uh, and certainly from my point of view, it's always been something of a sort of weird oddity uh, that von Neumann entropies play this huge role in holography, um, yet holography only involves a single copy of a quantum state. Uh, so normally in quantum information, any operational interpretation of the von Neumann entropy with some couple of minor obscure exceptions uh, has to involve like a, a large number of identical quantum states. Uh, and in fact, any time you don't have a large number of identical quantum states, you go to the one-shot setting, then the, the entropies that matter are instead these smooth minimax entropies. Um, yet in gravity, von Neumann entropies seem to be the crucial thing that would determine what the entanglement wedge was and stuff like that. Um, so the sort of nice answer to this from, from our work it's just that actually it was always the smooth min and max entities that mattered. They were the things that determined whether entanglement reconstruction was possible. They determine whether quantum extreme surface prescription is valid. Uh, so it's exactly like ordinary one shot quantum Shannon theory. Um, it was just that in practice, the sort of states we, we were typically considering gravity were, were things like thermal states and pure states and stuff like that. And, and you know, the vacuum state entanglement, but again, it's entanglement where the smooth min and max entropies are placed the von Neumann entropy. Um, they weren't situations where, where the smooth min and max entropies gave different answers to the von Neumann entropy. So we were fine just using the von Neumann entropy and we could sort of forget that the, the, the min and max entropies exist. Um, so yeah, that's, that's all I have to say. Um, yeah, hope you uh, got something out of it. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the great talk. Um, so it's time for questions. Uh, let's take some questions now. Please unmute your mic and ask questions. So, uh, yeah, if I can ask. So it seemed that the, the, the key point in the calculation by a replica trick was that there are some permutations um, of the some cent of the central region, I think you labeled it pi or something, and yep. that if we so I sorry I didn't follow all the details, but you sum when you sum the, all the details weren't there, so they were not possible to follow. They were not meant to be followed. Okay, so, so yeah. when you sum over these permutations, which naively you might have forgotten, but if you actually do that, that's when you get the correct answer that the entropy for the mixed case 
is the one predicted yep. by on general grounds by quantum information. The one. Yeah, exactly. So, so, so one thing that I maybe didn't emphasize, but I sort of should have done, is that for say n equals two or n equals three or so on, then these these extra permutations give contributions that are exponentially suppressed. Uh -huh. um, so and so you might think you're really safe ignoring them. But somehow when you take the, the analytic continuation and get very close to one, yeah. then they, they rise up and stop being exponentially suppressed and just completely change the answer. I see. Um, so and now, it's, I see. Now supposing we yeah. generalized your, uh, your, your example to you know, a large number of disconnected boundary regions uh, in, in that large yeah. limit, does this become more important, less? I suppose yes, more. so it, it I, I mean it'll it'll work basically the same way the The fact that I considered two boundary regions was was really unimportant. It was just a simple example I could use. The key point is that you have two different extremal surfaces uh, so let me annotate um, so with a, a large number of boundary regions so one, two, three. You know, my boundary region is all these different intervals. Then there's again, well, there's now, I guess, there's all sorts of uh, extremal surfaces, but really there's uh, two that will matter, which uh, well, in yeah, it, it is going to be more complicated because you're going to have more than two extremal surfaces, but yeah. you, you certainly do have two that, like, you know, you have the, the sort of, fully disconnected and you have the fully connected. Uh, in um, principle, you can vary the lengths of each segment independently, right? So you have a lot. Yeah, of, exactly. You have a lot. So you, you could make it so that, say, these ones want to be connected, but then different ones won't. Exactly. So I think, what, yeah, what will happen is that you have more, let's say you measure the areas of sort of, yeah. it's a bit more complicated because you can't mesh, simultaneously measure the areas of intersecting surfaces uh, because they don't commute. Um, but yeah, what, roughly speaking, it will look like some more complicated tensor network, mm -hmm. um, which I, I think the answer to all that. Uh, yeah, but the, I, think, I think the problem is that it'll be harder to define the fixed area states and the non-fixed area states you have all sorts of complicated back reaction inflation. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the, the same basic effect will happen. Any more questions? Hi. Uh, so we saw that there was a problem when uh, the matter was in a mixed state. But shouldn't all the matter at a given time be in a pure state? If I consider all the matter there is. Uh, so there's no reason you have to, you have to do so. Um, so. So I can just prepare a mix state and the, the density matrix for a mixed state in gravity. Uh, but if you want to avoid having you know, the, the whole state be mixed, um, then there's a simple way to do it, which is just have the matter here be entangled with some matter way out here. Uh, and have the overall be state be pure, but have them entangled. That will, that will work exactly the same way. Um, because this, this you know, the, the, the generalized entropies here are still a1 plus s and a2, right? The fact that there's this purification way off outside both the entanglement wedges doesn't, doesn't affect them. Oh. Thanks. Any more questions? Uh, please unmute yourself and... Okay, if not, then I have a question for Jeff. Uh, so uh, there is, uh, I think, uh, some activity now to understand even uh, uh, ADS safety with boundaries. And, and in this context, uh, there are uh, people as, uh, I mean, in condensed literature, people actually compute the entanglement, the boundary entanglement entropy, where you take trace over a part of the boundary and you uh, compute the von Neumann entropy of, the, of that remaining part. So if I, I mean, uh, so you, there... you mean you mean a BCFT? In the BCFT, 
BCFT and you're talking about computing the entropy of the boundary of the BCFT. Yeah, so to, to trace the whole rest of the boundary and uh, within the BCFT, yes. Yep. And uh, so I was thinking if, uh, if one could kind of uh, take, take over your ge geometric analogies and also this uh, correspondence with Shannon one-shot theory, one-shot Shannon theory there. Um, do you think, uh, I mean, this, this is an important question because people try to understand uh, what kind of rational CFT would be describing the boundary theory of a quantum hall, a fractional quantum hall effect or something like that. So. Yeah, yeah. So, um, okay, let me, let me just make some, some simple comments initially. Uh, so, a boundary CFT, the, the so duality, conjecture duality, is that the, the bulk will have some sort of end of the world brain um, that it ends on um, going in there. And so then the, the sort of version of the Rion Hakinari formula that's going to apply uh, is you're just going to, you know, if you look at sort of the entropy of, of this region out here, um, then the surface can, you can have an ordinary Rion Hakinari surface a bit like that, but you can also have a surface that, um, ends on the, the brain, like this. Um, and yeah, depending on the state, of, then, then there may be sort of different regions of this brain that are entangled or something that would then contribute. So the general rule is just allowed to enter the brain and just get the, the errors, these two things. Um, okay, so, so how does this relate to the stuff I've just been talking about? Um, so certainly you can just put you know, bulk matter sort of in here or something that, that is incompressible, that, that has a very non-flat entanglement spectrum, and then you'll, you'll get all the effects I've just talked about. Um, you could also potentially, if you had a large amount of degrees of freedom on this brain, um, then you could imagine doing the same thing with degrees of freedom there. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't think anything terribly different would happen. So I haven't thought about it hard. Um, it's also the case that the, the sort of, you know, the BCFT duality is uh, a very bottom up, right? Like we, we, we get reasonable answers for them, but we, we don't have terribly concrete top down models where we can say this particular boundary thing is exactly due to this particular bulk thing, uh, at least that I know of. Um, so. so there could be multiple saddles, right, in this specific context, and would you like to compute all the take all effect of all the saddles in the gravitational? Yeah, particle? so I I would expect in in this context, so I, yeah, I would just expect that you 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 have exactly the same thing of like, you know, the stuff here would get glued around cyclically, the stuff sort of here would not get glued around. And in this region, you can sort of have any permutation happening you want, and you should sum over all those permutations. And yeah, the, the, you know, the permutations. Uh, oh, I guess, yeah, one comment is um, the, when we were doing this in the, the paper in November, then we were doing JT gravity with end of the world brains, which really is analogous to like, yeah, it's like a, a BCFT1. Um, <laughs> whatever that means. Okay, so yeah, we, 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 we had yeah. regions ending on an end of the world brain. Um, so yeah, it, it, you can refer to that paper for exactly these sort of things. Cool. Okay, thanks. Uh, so let us thank Jeff again for this uh, great talk and staying up so late for us. Maybe it's already a bit <laughs> Great talk. Okay. Thanks a lot. Okay, uh, Jeff, we will send you the video recording and the slides will be up. Uh, okay. Thanks a lot. <laughs> See you again uh, next week. Bye.